Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, and we're talking today about a very exciting topic for me. Not that long ago, I baptized, along with her father, a young lady, and uh, we were in a river, and we put her in the water and laid hands on her afterwards for the Holy Spirit. Maybe 20 people or so were watching and excited, and I'm excited to think about it. And I'm wondering if you are still excited about your own baptism. Are you still thrilled when you hear someone's getting baptized? Because after the laying on of hands on this young lady where we ask God's Holy Spirit, at the end of that, I said, welcome sister, you're my sister now fully in Christ. And what a joyful time that was. Her father helped with the baptism and together we put her in the water. So I'm updating the audio sermon I have on baptisms. I say baptisms because the Bible speaks of there's one baptism, but it also speaks of baptisms in Hebrews 6, baptism of the water, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the baptism of fire. And we're going to talk about the one you don't want uh, as we go along. So even if you've, quote-unquote, been in the church for 30 years or more, I hope this sermon can reignite some feelings and, and excitement in your heart. Preparing the sermon has been good for me. It made me remember and review everything I have to review. So welcome again to Light on the Rock. Christ, which means anointed, is our light. He is our rock. And we all together come under God Most High, God the Father. And He is our supreme authority. And His Word, His Kingdom, which is now bequeathed and shared with Christ, it will share it in turn with us, all because He, God the Father, chose you to be among the first fruits. What a high calling that is. Uh, look up the word cherish and, and see if you can... Uh, check out that sermon. It was based on Pentecost, but I think you'll enjoy it. Cherish your high calling. Six reasons to. We're trying also to make it easier to leave comments on, on blogs and sermons, so I hope you will take the time to do that. We're going to cover a lot today. We're going to cover do you need to be baptized? When, how old must you be, or should you be, ideally, to be baptized? Can I baptize children and babies? Um, is baptism required for salvation? What does the word baptize mean? Uh, it doesn't mean sprinkling. Can't mean sprinkling. I'll go into that. Uh, does someone have to be an ordained minister, an elder, ordained elder, to do baptizing? How about to do laying on of hands? So... Again, I'll show you scriptures on that. And um, should, any, should anyone ever consider being re-baptized? You've been baptized. You were even immersed. But now you realize certain things, and should you be re-baptized? We'll talk about that. So anyway, back to Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit was given, and Yeshua had said, Stay in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit. And that was given on the day of Pentecost, a holy day, God's holy day. Some of you are parts of groups and who believe the holy days are no longer required. And yet the very new covenant church of God started on God's holy day, Pentecost. If we aren't supposed to keep the holy days anymore, wouldn't that be confusing to have the Son of God say, stay here until you receive the Holy Spirit, and Father sent it on Pentecost. So yes, we keep the holy days, and you should be. And if you don't think you should be, let's talk. Contact me, let's talk. I have sermons on that. And in fact, the holy days depict God's plan of salvation. So in Acts 2.38, the people were convicted by what Peter was saying, that they had killed the Messiah. What? You know, what should we do? And uh, my voice hasn't changed yet. I'm still waiting for puberty, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, what, what did Peter say to them? 
he said, repent and be baptized, Acts 2.38, for the remission of your sins. Jesus had said something powerful in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. You have to believe in Christ. You have to have faith in him. You have to have faith in God's righteousness through Christ over you and in you. That's all part of being a believer. You believe that he's the Messiah, the one sent to be the anointed. If you, He who believes and is baptized, verse 16, will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So publicly confessing your belief is also part of it, as you'll read in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. We might have time to look at that later. What does baptize mean? I have so much to cover, I'm going to speak up a little faster now. It comes from the Greek word, baptize comes from the Greek word, baptizo. It'd be like taking the word baptize and changing the E on the end to an O. That's, we literally just transliterated it, took the Greek word, borrowed it, used it in English as baptize. In Greek, it absolutely means to immerse, put down into the water. We read in John 3, verse 23, that John the baptizer, he wasn't a member of a Baptist church. Uh, he was a baptizer, John the Baptist. John 3, 23, he did his baptizing in the Jordan, for there was much water there. If he was just sprinkling, he would have just had a pitcher full of water and done a whole bunch of people with a pitcher full of water sprinkling. He didn't. He put them in the water, as you'll see. Mark 1, verses 9 to 11 in the NIV. Mark 1, verses 9 to 11, talking about Jesus coming down from Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As John, as Jesus, was coming up out of the water. So he obviously was put in under the water. He saw heaven open up and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. The literal translation version says uh, he was immersed by John in the Jordan. Immersed. In Acts 8, 38-39, describing Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, um, it says in verse 38, Acts 8, 38, Philip and the eunuch went down into, went down into, went down into the water. So baptism is immersion, submersion into water. Okay, and then let's go on. It also pictures you telling God, I don't want my old self. I want to bury that old self. I want the old self to die in me, and I want the new self to be the risen Christ. So when we put you under the water, that's picturing your death and burial, and you're being buried with Christ. You're dying with Christ into his death. And we bring you back up from the water. That pictures the resurrection Christ now living in you making you a new person in his body, in his, in him. When I go like this, we always had people, uh, I, I had them do this, hold their hands out in front of them like this, and then I would take their hand like this and my other hand behind their back and put them under the water and back up again real quick. And uh, that's what the father and I, the father of this lady and I did when, when she was baptized. So as you're coming up out of the water, it pictures your resurrection with Christ. It pictures your being, because you're in him, because you're part of him, whatever happened to him, his, his crucifixion, you were part of that, according to what we're going to be reading here. And his, his resurrection, you were part of that. So that's what baptism pictures. That's so exciting when you really understand it. All right? Romans 6, verses 1 to 6 explains all that. What shall I say then? Romans 6, 1 to 6. Shall we continue in sin? Should we continue sinning just so grace can abound? Because in chapter 5, he had ended chapter 5 by, sending, by saying where sin uh, is and, and abounds, uh, grace superabounds. There's even more grace. 
But should we sin just to show that there's grace? They said, no, you can't keep living that old way anymore. You can't keep living as a way of life, of living common law with somebody, or living uh, an adulterous situation, or getting drunk uh, every other night. As a regular practice, uh, this, you know, you can't keep doing these things. You can't keep stealing time from your boss like you have been. And when he's away, you just get on the cell phone and use up the time that he's paying you for. That's stealing. You've got to stop that. You can't keep breaking the Sabbath and the holy days. You can't keep using God's name in vain and profanity, the F word and everything else. No, that's the old way. You buried that in baptism. How shall we, Romans 6, 2, who, were, who died to sin, live in it any longer? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized, immersed into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, Therefore, we were buried with him. So it wasn't just our own death, but we're buried with him in his death. That's also something you must understand. Through baptism into death, that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We also should be resurrected to a new way. We still all still sin, but the constant living a life of sin, constantly lying, that's got to stop. Constantly coveting what's not ours has to stop. Lusting, pornography, things like that. It's got to stop. We can't do those as a way of life. We still slip up from time to time in various ways. We lose our temper, our patience, or whatever. We repent. God forgives that. But it should more and more that we are growing to be more and more like Christ in his image. Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. So it's picturing our death and the death of Christ, our death of Christ with him and in him. And then in, um, we should no longer be slaves of sin. So that's why it says in Galatians 2, 20 and 21 that, that I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. Make it very personal. He is my Savior. He is my Savior. He's my Savior. God the Father is my God. Remember when Jesus was talking to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection. He says, I must go to your father, to my father, he says, and your father, to my God and your God. He doesn't just say I have to go to God. He says, I have to go to my God, your God. I have to go to my father. Start personalizing that God is your father, your God. Jesus is your savior, your brother, your king, my king. Use my and our. Something magical begins to happen as you take ownership that even the kingdom of God is my kingdom. America is my country. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just the country. It's my country. It's my land. And so, um, verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, Galatians 2.21, for if righteousness could come through the law, then Christ died in vain. It has to be a righteousness by faith, as it says at the end of verse 20. Uh, I, I, the, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, or even of the Son of God. You, it's his faith. It's faith in him. It's both. Who loved me and gave himself for me. And then in Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, I've often quoted this one. Our being raised up out of the water pictures the risen Christ that we're copying that. And then when we receive the Holy Spirit, Christ and Father come live in us by their Spirit. John 14, 23. We will come and make our abode in you. John 14, 23. So Paul says that in chapter 3, verse 8 of Philippians to 11. Philippians 3, 8 to 11. He says, all these wonderful things I can say about myself, all the trophies I've had. All the things I've been awarded, all the good things people said about me, the position I'd raised up 
as the, being taught at the feet of Gamaliel. It's a bunch of dung. That's all it is to me. A bunch of dung. I don't want that anymore. And we have the same attitude now. That my everything about me is gone. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, my new life is in God, is in Christ. That I may gain Christ. Philippians 3, the last part of 8, and verse 9 now, and be found in Him. I don't want him looking at me and my righteousness. I want him looking at God and I mean the Son of God's righteousness. Not, not having my own righteousness. This is why so many of you feel so down because you look at your own righteousness and you're failing. And I'm failing. We all still sin. But we have to learn what Paul said in Romans 7. But that is no longer me. That's the old me that died, but somehow pops back to life somehow. And That's not me who sins. Romans 7, verses 14 to 21, he says it two or three times. The real me is the one that's in Christ. And there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So, that's why he's saying, I don't want my own goodness. I want the best God can do, which is from the law. He says, I don't want my own righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see the difference? You now say, I know I still sin, but my joy is in the Father through Christ because it's his own righteousness covering me. Go to my website and put in the search bar God's perfection and put in the search bar God's righteousness and you'll see sermons there that explain this in detail how that happens. You must understand this or you'll never experience the joy of salvation because you know that you always fail. You still fail. And you keep saying, well, I thought I gave my life to Christ and look at me, I'm still doing all these things. Okay, not having my righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So when we have the Holy Spirit, we now have God in us. We now, because of the Holy Spirit, are ourselves set apart to be holy people, saints, called out ones, holy, set apart from the world, that though we are still imperfect, what God, what you want God to see is Christ in you, that you seek him and you ask him to be your life. That's all pictured by when you're baptized, going under the water and come back up out of the water. It's all pictured by that. So baptism is accepting God's calling. What a calling that is. God the Father does not even let Jesus be the one to call you. Yeshua, Jesus, said, Yeshua means salvation. It's Hebrew for Jesus. Yeshua, not Yahshua. It's Yeshua. He said, no one can come to me except the Father in heaven. Draw him. That's God the Father draws him. And so he's the one who personally selected you, personally selected me. How awesome is that? That God the Father wants to live in you. You know how when you go live with somebody or they come and live with you for a while? Like Mark Twain said, after, after three days, fish and guests stink. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. But God isn't like that. He wants to live in you from now on and wants you to living in him because he, lo he, he, likes you. <laughs> he loves you and likes you wants to be with you forever. Think about the meaning of what I just said. So anyway, baptism is one of the six basic doctrines of Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 3. It starts with repentance from dead works. Paul is saying, let's not have to go back over these things over and over, but I will just quickly here. Repentance from dead works. Repenting means turning back to God, becoming converted, changing, uh, turning around, Faith towards God, once you've repented, it's because you have faith in God and what he's doing in you. It's because of that. You understand what I'm saying? 
and baptisms, because there are several baptisms. I'm going to read those in a minute. And then there's the laying on of hands. We lay hands up to set apart somebody for anointing, for anointing for healing, for anointing to high priest as a king. They were anointed, had oil poured over their head. And we lay hands on someone being ordained. And we lay hands on someone who's, we're asking God after baptism to send his Holy Spirit now. And you receive that by faith. You may not feel a warmth going over you. You may not speak in tongues immediately, or you may, but you may not. Or you may not have the wind and the fire and all that stuff, uh, the, the tongues of fire. But by faith, you receive the Holy Spirit by the laying out of hands and the resurrection of the dead. They're not in heaven, otherwise there'd be no need for resurrection. When we die, we die. It's a sleep. The Bible calls it a sleep. Jesus said, my friend Lazarus sleeps. And then he said he died. And Paul talks about sleep, meaning those who died. Jesus said, no one, no one has ascended to heaven. No one's in heaven. No one. In Acts 2, I think verse 35, 34, 35, somewhere in there, Peter even says, for even David has not gone to heaven. If David's not in heaven, then no one's in heaven. They're all waiting for the resurrection. A lot of you ministers are still preaching. We go to heaven or hell upon immediate, immediately upon our death. If that's the case, why is there a need for a judgment? Why is there a need for a resurrection and all that? And then eternal judgment. All of this starts when God personally chooses to call you. Not because you're so good, but because he's so good. Because of his righteousness. Because he is so gracious. Jot down Titus 3, verses 4 to 7. And see if you can, um, see if you can cover those. <clears throat> And read those. Read that, I meant to say, not because of our works of our righteousness, but because of his grace, we're able to be called. And God in heaven looks down from heaven and says, I want to call Sam. I want to call Helen. I want to call Philip. And the process begins. What a high, high calling. What a unique calling that is. How many billions of people, eight billion and you know that very few who call themselves Christians are really acting and living like Christians or someone filled with the Holy Spirit. What a high calling that is. I hope you get excited about it. I hope you get real excited about it. Now, after the water baptism, an ordained elder comes and lays hands on your head and asks God to give you the even more important baptism than the one by water, which was a really a symbol of what you've already done in your heart. Water baptism is picturing what you've already said and done in your heart. So then what happens is that we're now immersed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. I believe all the disciples of Christ were baptized by John the Baptist as Christ himself was. But then the laying on of hands and receiving the Holy Spirit is another kind of baptism. So 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. For as the body is one, but has many parts of that body, many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. He's just saying, look, we have a hand and feet and mouth and nose and ears and all that. And these come together as one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all immersed into one body. By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews, Greeks, whatever, slaves or free, we've all made to be we've all been made to drink into one spirit. So then you go back to what John the Baptist was doing. Many were coming to him as he was baptizing. He saw the Pharisees and others there who hadn't really repented. They just wanted to be part of this thing that was happening. So Luke 3, 
John, Luke 3, I'll start in verse 16. John answered saying, look, I'm not the Christ. He said, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap, I'm not even worth, worthy of being his slave, is what he's saying. He will baptize, immerse you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will immerse you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Depends on where you're com coming from on this. He says his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather the wheat, the good stuff, into his barn, but the chaff, the junk, the garbage, shall he shall burn with unquenchable fire. That's not the fire that was seen in Acts 2, which were little tongues of fire that alighted, or uh, anyway, alighted on each of them. It didn't burn them up. It was an unquenchable fire. We don't even know how long they were seen as being on top of their heads. But might have been just seconds, might have been a minute or two. I doubt, I doubt much longer than that. But it didn't burn them up with unquenchable fire. The fire mentioned here is burning garbage up, burning chaff up, burning something not useful to God up, burning those up. There's no hint that those in Acts 2 were seen as chaff, just waiting to be burned up. So the three baptisms, two you want, the baptism by repentance and water, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, being immersed in the Holy Spirit, becoming a part of the body of Christ. And the one you don't want, the baptism of fire. I believe we need to rekindle the fire in our hearts for God. We need to revitalize our calling. We need to get excited about it again. Yes, all of that has to happen. But we don't want to be burned up like chaff. In Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, Jesus told the assembled group, Acts 1, 4 and 5, before Pentecost, being assembled together with them, he commanded them, commanded them, don't go anywhere, don't depart from Jerusalem, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized you with water, you shall be immersed, baptized, with the Holy Spirit, with the set-apart Spirit. Not many days from now, the complete Jewish Bible says, you'll be immersed in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened. They were filled with the gift of God's Holy Spirit just a few days later. Now, so we're baptized. We become a part of Christ's body. And we think of a body, the body of Christ. We normally, most of you, think of the body of Christ as the church, the people of believers who assemble on the Sabbath and worship and sing and and listen to sermons and so on, or study Torah, whatever you're doing. That's true. The body of Christ is that greater community, yes. But also think of the body of Christ as being, uh, being immersed into the very body itself of Jesus Christ. Being immersed right into the very body of Jesus Christ. In him. In him. And that way, when it says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we're seated with him in the heavenly places, it's because I'm part of his body. I'm part of his body. And wherever he is, I'm part of that. We don't think of that part of being in him enough. I need to give a sermon on that. I know I keep saying that. i got to do it. I have some sermons on. I'm sure I do. But I've got to do an updated so anyway, don't lose your first love. Rekindle that fire, but don't, you don't want to be burned up. And Paul reminds us to be, stay clear of sexual sins. Don't come into union with other women if you're married, because that makes you one flesh. And after saying all of that, he says in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. He who is joined to the Lord. So God gives us the Holy Spirit. We have our spirit in man these couple together, or God's Spirit couples with God's Spirit in us, maybe that's maybe the better way of putting it, and that becomes like a man and wife coming together, one flesh, but this time we become one spirit. I don't hear a lot of 
people talking about that verse. But we have to understand it. It's a beautiful thing. So don't get so stuck on doctrine that you forget that you are one spirit with the Son of God. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. We have been betrothed, it says, to one husband to be presented as a chaste virgin to the anointed one, to Christ, to Messiah, to Jesus. We're engaged because of this high calling, because of receiving the Holy Spirit. You are engaged, betrothed to the Son of God if you have the Holy Spirit. That should be just so thrilling to all of us, male and female. Do you know who you are? You are one called by no one less than the highest being in the whole universe who purposely, don't get proud about it because he purposely chose you, not many mighty, noble and wise and all that, but he called the base of the world, the despised of the world, the nobodies, that he may be glorified in what he can do through these nobodies, called fishermen. Look what he did with Peter and James and John and Andrew who were fishermen. He called a despised tax collector like Matthew, Levi. These are the people he had called. And look what he did. He can do the same with you and me. You have been picked by God Most High, given to Christ to work with. And what a joy that should be. What a thrilling that should, uh, uh, thought that should be. And not even Jesus selected you, though, or chose you, God. Uh, the one who called you was God the Father. Then he gives you to Jesus, and he does choose you. John 15, verse 15 and 16, he says, I'm not even, I'm not even calling you servants anymore. I'm calling you friends, because servants don't know what's going on in the head of the Master, but I've told you everything going on in the Father. John 15, verses 15 and 16. Verse 16, you did not choose me, I chose you. When you were called and you responded to the call, you're just... Letting Christ choose you. God led you to baptism. God led you to repentance. And he gets the glory. So be sure that when he says here in John 15, 16, your fruit should remain the last half of it, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. When you pray, don't, please don't say in Jesus' name about every trivial thing. I'm going to clean up the house in Jesus' name. I'm going to take the garbage out in Jesus' name. I'm going to go buy a new car in Jesus' name. Unless Jesus told you to do certain things in Scripture or some other way, don't trivialize it. So you rarely hear me talking about doing something in Jesus' name. Unless I know for sure that I can. So... If you're casting out demons, yeah, you do that in Jesus' name. If you're asking the blessing on the food and thanking God for providing everything, yes, in Jesus' name, at the end of your prayer. When you anoint someone for healing, yes, you better end that prayer in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. So I'm saying that because I often hear sermons too, or, or, or prayers, that just at the end says amen with no in Jesus' name. So you need to say, in Yeshua's name, amen. Now, if someone's praying something that's all theologically wrong, and they end their prayer in Jesus' name, I don't say amen at the end of that prayer. I don't go along with it. But do as you pray, ask things in Jesus' name. And you become one spirit with Christ, as I said, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Cherish that high calling. It's very, very precious to be the first fruits. The firstborn ones were given a double portion. We are the first fruits. James 1.18, we are a kind of first fruits. Romans 14, uh, Revelation 14 talks about 144,000 who are called the first fruits standing on the sea of glass. In chapter 15, I think it mentions the sea of glass. Chapter 14, it says they're before the thrones of the 24 elders of the four living creatures in heaven. That was after the resurrection, because we go to heaven to get married. Like Revelation 19 says, then we all come back with our leader 
on whose thigh it's written, the word of God. Who's that? We know that's Jesus. Brethren, this is exciting. I hope you haven't lost that first love. I hope you haven't lost your zeal. I hope you're not becoming, or any of us are becoming, Laodicean. I have repented over and over so many times in the last few years, in the last few months, of lukewarmness, lack of zeal, getting callous with letting sins in my life I shouldn't. If I can admit that, I hope you can, and I hope you also will rekindle this excitement for the high calling. Cherish it. Have a dream. Have a dream. I had a dream when I was 18. It's time to get baptized. I was in England. I was at a college. We were at the Feast of Tabernacles in Minehead, England. And I'd gone to bed. We were sharing a room with probably four or five people, four or five men in my room. And as I lay there thinking about what am I going to do, I should get baptized. I should, why am I not baptized? Have I accepted Jesus as my Savior? And then uh, three or four senior men came in. I was a freshman. And they were talking about their high calling. They were talking about the women. And they were talking about the women in very righteous terms, clean terms. I remember that that struck me. I've got to clean up my head, clean up my mind, clean up my mouth. God's got to clean it up. I just even asked God right then and there, please, like Isaiah, touch me, touch my tongue, clean me up. Cleanse me, Lord. Take me. Forgive me. And that was the beginning of a series of steps. I then asked for counseling for baptism. I was counseled. And then I sat in this big watery tank. And he asked me if I'd accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior and realized that he was the Son of God who died for me and was resurrected. And have I repented of my sins, the breaking of God's commandments, and committing now to live a life in Christ? Words similar to that. And I said, yes, I have. And then I was baptized. And I came up out of that watery grave, cleansed, all my sins washed away in baptism and in the blood of Christ. It was baptism. I felt happy. I felt relieved. If you're at that point and not yet baptized, why? What are you waiting for? Talk to us immediately. Talk to a good minister and let's get you baptized. Part of getting ready for baptism, I found out to my dismay that some who are baptized said that they were never counseled on counting the cost. I had a man come to me one time and he says, I'd like to attend your church and all that. What will it cost me? And I explained to him, Jesus told the, the rich young ruler, sell everything you have and come and follow me. Paul said that everything he ever had, all his trophies and all his awards and all his kudos and all the good things everybody was saying about him was a bunch of dung in his eyes. Now in Philippians 3, around verse 5, 6, 7, 8, it says that. I, that means nothing to me now because he gave it all up. And later he says, having nothing, but having everything. When we give it all up for God, we give him our bicycle and a few books that we own. I'm just using an example by comparison. He gives us the universe. He gives us his son. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us position in the kingdom. So we can better serve the world than they're being served now. So counting the cost means you're also aware that you're going to have to give up. Be willing to give it up all, including your very life. 
if they say at some point to you, we need you to say, I curse the name of Jesus. I am not a Christian. I am not a believer. Or we'll shoot you or we'll cut your head off. Right now you make the choice. I guess my head will be cut off and I'll joyfully do so. Right now. I know that would be scary. But counting the cost, look at Luke 6, verse 22 and 23. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, cancel you, revile you, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy, for indeed, leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. And in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Any discussion on baptism should be incomplete without reading the counting the cost passage. Luke 14, 25 to 33 is the count the cost passage. I hope this was read to you, excuse me. Got an itchy nose. <laughs> now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and doesn't hate, it's a Hebraic thought but that meant to love less by comparison. Does not love less by comparison. His father, mother, wife, and children. We're supposed to love our wife. We're supposed to love our children. So he's not saying hate them in the way we take the word English, hate. He says you have to love them less than me. And his brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also. You have to love your own life less than me. You cannot be my disciple, Jesus says. Whoever doesn't bear his cross and come and after me cannot be my disciple. And he goes on to say, you don't build a building, a church, a tower or anything and don't, without the money to finish it. He says, count the cost. What do I need? Where's the money coming from? Otherwise, people will mock you. Verse 33, so likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has. So I was telling the man who asked me, what's going to cost me? I said, really? I read him this verse. Whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And I said, look, I'm not going to ask you for a single penny today or any time. But I'm saying you in your heart have to be willing to forsake all that you have or you can't follow Christ. I never saw the man again. Sad. So make sure it's part of your repentance that you're counting the cost of what it takes to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Once you've counted the cost, once you've repented, what are you waiting for? Don't delay. Don't delay. As I stood there dripping wet in 1971, the minister then bowed his head again and laid his hands on my head and asked God to give me the Holy Spirit. Of course, he bowed his head before we did this even, that God would bless this baptism. Then he laid his hands on me afterwards. I was 18. I felt washed. I felt repentant, I felt renewed, I felt happy, I felt very serious. Even I was forgiven. And even you. So don't delay it. Now, neither should you and I put it off once you've repented. In telling his story about his calling on the road to Damascus, which is in Acts 9, he's recounting it in Acts 22, verses 14 to 16. And then Ananias said, when Ananias had come to him, he, he Ananias said, the God of our fathers, Paul, remember Ananias had been told by God to go find this guy, Paul, and baptize him. And Ananias is saying, wait a minute, Lord, haven't you gotten the memo? He's a, bad, he, he's a bad dude. I want nothing to do with him. 
God said, no, I have many things that I'm going to use them for, so go baptize them. And then in the account in Acts 9, the beautiful thing that Ananias does when he comes, his first words to Paul, Brother Saul, or Paul, whatever it was back then in Acts 9, Saul was his Hebrew name, Paul was his Greek name, Paul means little. Brother, it's the first word out of his, mind, out of his mouth, and he touched Paul. And the scales of blindness fell off Paul. Anyway, so Paul's recounting that story here in Acts 22, verses 14 to 16. Then Ananias, he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will. See the just one, see Yeshua. Hear the voice of his mouth, which he did many times after this. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. That's why I'm reading from here, because I, I like the wording here. Why are you waiting? Come on, get up. There was no continued counseling. Paul had been fasting. Paul had not eaten a thing. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. When we baptize someone, when I baptize someone now, I baptize them in the name of the Lord. Matthew 28, 19, that says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all added words, according to Eusebius, the historian. He said the, the original words were always, uh, make disciples of all nations in my name. And that's exactly what happened every single time in the book of Acts. And in, in fact, the accounting here, calling on the name of the Lord. Anyway, back to this thing of waiting. Don't wait. Don't wait till you think you're finally good enough to be baptized, because I'll say now you have self-righteousness. Go and repent of that, then come back. You're not baptized because you're good enough. You're baptized because he's good enough. God is calling you. And you want that to come upon you. Your goodness, your righteousness is as filthy rags. Don't delay. And ministers, don't delay someone's baptism just so you have something to show, to show off <laughs> at the Feast of Tabernacles or some other thing. Don't delay. Sure, you can tell people at the feast, we baptize five people or ten, ten people, and they're so and so and so and so. But hey, if this was a month before the, or two months before the feast and they're ready to be baptized, do it. That's the example all through Scripture. There was no delay for the 3,000 in Acts 2. There was no delay for the Ethiopian eunuch. In fact, he's the one who said, hey, wait, there's some water right there. Why can't we go ahead and get baptized now? And he was. There was no delay for any of these, for Cornelius' household, for the Philippian jailer and his household, right then and there, that very day, that very night. So don't turn baptisms into a show at the feast. Get it done. Let them have God's Spirit working with them for a few weeks before. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. Um, this was a command on, on, uh, that Jesus gave. Go therefore, make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all things I have commanded you, including that. So either these words were not there originally, as the historian Eusebius says, or the apostles and Philip and others who baptized and Paul didn't obey. Because every single time we're told about baptizing, they were baptizing in the name of Jesus and only in the name of Jesus. Peter said that in Acts 2.38, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Philip the deacon had baptized Samaritans. He's not an elder yet at this point. But only in the name of the Lord Jesus, Acts 8, 16. Only in the name of the Lord Jesus. But they hadn't had the hands laid on them yet. They hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet, if you read the whole thing in Acts 8. Acts 10, 48, the household of Cornelius, Peter commanded they be baptized, commanded they be baptized in the name of the Lord. No mention of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because we're actually baptized into the body of Christ. We're not baptized into the Father. We're not baptized into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27. Acts 19, verses 5-7. to When they had heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 19.5. And then Paul laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. There are about 12 of them in all. Every single recorded baptism where it's mentioned that whose name they baptized in, every single time was in the name of Jesus. You ministers need to write down the verses I just gave, have them handy to show people who question you on this. Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, Acts 10.48, Galatians 3.27, Acts 19.5. It's there in the notes in any case. Isn't that clear now? Into whose name are you baptized? Into Christ Jesus. Something else happens in Acts 19 that's of interest. If you read Acts 19, verses 1 to 7, or maybe it's 1 to 6, no, 1 to 7. Well, let's read that first. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, it's in what is now Turkey. Finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, we've never even so much as heard of something called the Holy Spirit. He said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. So Paul said, yes, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on anointed Yeshua, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had, had laid, laid hands upon them, uh, I read that earlier, they spoke in tongues, they received the Holy Spirit, and they prophesied. So repentance is always the first thing that comes before baptism. And they had done that. They had been baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. And yet Paul still rebaptized them because they had no knowledge of the Holy Spirit and had obviously not received it. There had been no laying on of hands. So they were rebaptized. By rebaptism, I mean regardless of your baptism history, should you ever consider being rebaptized? There are times to consider that don't want thousands of people all suddenly wanting to be rebaptized. But here are the things that would make someone's baptism invalid in my mind. If the person never really repented. I remember asking a man in New Brunswick. I remember asking in Canada. I remember asking him. Uh, he was asking me about the baptism. I said, well, you've been baptized, right? He said, yes. I said, did you repent? He said, no, and I was never asked if I had repented. I was simply baptized. I said, yes, we need to rebaptize you then. And let's make sure you understand repentance. So that's the first thing that I talked about. Repentance, changing, giving up life of sin. 
Certainly, if you're very young, when you were baptized in some denomination that baptizes seven-year-olds and nine-year-olds, then how could you really understand true repentance? So if you haven't repented, get rebaptized. If you didn't publicly confess that you believe in and confess publicly the Lord Jesus. So when I baptize, I always say to the person, have you repented of your sins, which is the breaking of God's holy, righteous law, and have you accepted Jesus as your Lord, Savior, and King? And do you believe in him, that he is the Son of God who died for you and was resurrected for you? In Jesus' name, do you believe all that? Do you acknowledge that? Do you confess him as your Lord and Savior? And in the hearing of others, they have to say, yes, I have done so. Yes, I do. It's almost like a marriage uh, betrothal. And uh, marriage. Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. If you did not publicly confess and haven't since then said those words of Romans 9, uh, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, you might consider rebaptism in that case. That if you confess with your mouth, Romans 10, 9, the Lord Jesus, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. Our righteousness is the righteousness by faith. It's not the righteousness of our own works. We'll be rewarded by our works we're saved by God's righteousness. Don't mix the two up all the time. Verse 10, with the heart one believes to righteousness, with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So make sure you do, not just at baptism, but even the rest of your life, you're willing to bring up the name Jesus Christ and not as a curse word. Not when you're mad, but as testimony to other people. If you weren't, if you weren't fully immersed, but were sprinkled instead, you have to be fully immersed. That pictures your whole old self going under. I tried to baptize a small lady one time in our bathtub. My wife was there watching and helping. We thought we could do it. But <laughs> her elbow would pop up. Something else would pop up. We were trying to keep her down. Almost drowned the poor woman. So that was early, 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 like in my 20s. I'm 70 years old, and I've learned how to baptize better. We don't, I'd never try it in a, in a bathtub anymore. Nor would I do it in a shower. That's not immersion, okay? So if you weren't fully immersed, you're just sprinkled. You need to be rebaptized. If you didn't understand what you were doing and everything about it was wrong, get rebaptized. If a false minister baptized you, look, they even rebaptized someone baptized by John the Baptist. False minister baptized you, and these things weren't explained properly, you didn't count the cost and all that. Yeah, be rebaptized. If you really feel a need to be rebaptized, besides what I've just said, you're not at peace. With your present baptism. You might consider that. Talk to a minister about rebaptizing you. And make sure they baptize you in the name of Jesus, not into the Catholic Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that was not in the original uh, scriptures. But only baptism of repentance and no explanation of Holy Spirit, they were rebaptized. In Acts 19. Repentance always where it starts. And I said also, don't keep delaying it. Don't keep saying, well, let's make sure they fully understand it. I'm, when I was in my 20s, the church I went to at the time, we were told, commanded, you don't baptize anybody until they read these lessons of the correspondence course on baptism, on repentance, and so on. That's got to happen first. They've got to read this booklet and that booklet by the church. They have to read the scriptures. 
You have to counsel them on repentance. You have to counsel them on counting the cost. Ask that they will fast before they get baptized. None of that's in Scripture. The 3,000 in Acts 2 were baptized, boom, the same day. Cornelius' household, men and women. The Philippian jailer's household. No delay. So don't make big requirements. That's wrong. It's not biblical. The main requirement is that they admit to have repented and admit that Jesus is their Savior and King and that they know he died for them and was resurrected. They say that. They believe that. They act that out. They live that. Boom! Baptize them. Don't delay. You ministers out in the field should probably buy one of these big water troughs. We've got one and we put it down in our basement. Although running water, I think, is still, still better. Still better. Living water, you know. We had an elderly man in one of the churches I was working in. Illiterate. Couldn't read. Couldn't write. Very old. Which, since I was in my 20s, meant he probably was 40. No, no, he, he was... He was probably 80s. And he came to me and he said, Sir, he said, I would like to be baptized. Now, this was during the time when we had to read these things and study these other things, read these booklets. He couldn't read. We were trying to put, we even had bought him a Bible, audio Bible, so he could read the Bible by hearing it so to speak, audio Bible. And I said to him, Sir, why do you want to be baptized? I was probably about 26 years old, 27. And he said, Sir, he said, I, I am a sinner. I want all my sins forgiven, buried in baptism. I want my sins washed in the blood of Jesus. You gave me the Bible to listen to and my sins are washed in his blood and washed away in baptism. Sir, I need to be baptized. There was a deacon standing next to me at the time and I looked at the deacon and I said, I've never heard a better answer. And we baptized him that very day. I hope you're all getting the point. Don't delay it. Do make sure they're repentant. Now, who can do the baptizing? Can just anyone baptize? Look at John 4, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, when the Lord knew, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. John 4, verse 1, verse 2 now. Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. The next part of the verse is he starts meeting with this woman at the well. Another great story. Jesus did all his baptisms more than John the Baptist was baptizing by his disciples. They weren't even ordained yet. They didn't even have the Holy Spirit yet. So do you have to be ordained to baptize? No. Clearly, no. Paul also said he was glad that he didn't baptize a lot except the very few he mentions, but he let others do it. Stephen, who baptized, who knows, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, in Samaria, was a deacon. He wasn't an ordained minister. But on the other hand, 
On the other hand, Philip didn't lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. He just reported back to Jerusalem, a lot of people in Samaria have been baptized. I did not lay hands on them. Why did he, did he not lay hands? It doesn't say. It just tells us he didn't. And then when Jerusalem, let's read it in Acts 8. Well, first of all, Acts 8, verses 5 to 8. I won't take time to read it. I'll put it on the notes that he went to Samaria and did a lot of miracles, casting out demons, healing the sick. Acts 8, verse 12. And when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and that's the full, complete, true gospel, the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Both men and women were baptized. Now I want you to note men and women. No mention of children. Both men and women were baptized. Nowhere can I see in Scripture where a single child or very young person is ever baptized. Although God, to be fair, God does work with children. I think God was working with me when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. In the Philippines, I would go for walks on the beach at South China Sea, in San Fernando, La Union. And I would pray in the, in, as the breezes would come upon me as I walked. I felt the closeness to God. Back then, God certainly worked with Samuel and was giving him his word. Jeremiah was very young. David was very young. So I, I, I won't be absolute. You can't baptize a child. I personally would not feel comfortable because it's such a momentous occasion. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But they're committing to marry Christ. Would I perform a wedding for an 8-year-old or 10-year-old? No, I wouldn't. Acts 8, verse 14. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who, when they'd come, prayed for them that they'd receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the, uh, he had not fallen upon none of them. And then they, the Holy Spirit, the Lord is the Spirit. So I say he now. I'm not going to call the Lord it. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, and then they only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. No Father, Son, Holy Spirit here. You see that. And then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. But who laid hands on them? It was ordained apostles, ordained leaders from Jerusalem. It wasn't the deacon Stephen. Does that mean that you have to be ordained to do laying out of hands? Um, I'm thinking so. But in the absence of any, any person who's ordained, properly ordained, well, ponder what I've just showed you. So anyway, um, if you're going to think about baptizing a child, person has to repent before baptism. Will they really understand repentance, commitment, right and wrong? Will they really be mature enough to see their real self? Baptism pictures be, being buried in Christ, coming out as a new person. Will they understand that? We're committing to be the bride of Christ. I would never perform a wedding for a nine-year-old or 12-year-old. So I personally would not baptize someone nine years old or 10 or 12. Some do, I don't. Is baptism required for salvation? Jesus did say that, I read that in Mark 16, that he who believes is baptized shall be saved. I read that in the beginning. And Peter said, be baptized for the remission of your sins. So I think baptism 
is very, very important. If the time comes that you know about baptism, you never quite did it, but now you really need to, but you're in a time of trouble, such as the world has never seen, and it's impossible to find an ordained minister to baptize and lay hands on you, does that mean you're condemned to hell forever? I think God understands. And I read of no baptism the way we practice it today in the Old Testament. They had the ritual washing on the mikveh, the pools. We, read, we don't read of Abraham being baptized. We don't read, you know, we have the symbolic baptisms of Israel in the Red Sea, of Noah and his family in the ark, water above and around and below. Peter talks about that and First Corinthians 10 talks about the Israelites were baptized in the Red Sea. But no baptism as we know it today. So if you can get baptized and you're listening to me now, what are you waiting for? As Ananias said to Paul, rise up, get baptized. We'll be glad to help you do it. Many of you in Kenya and Tanzania are listening to this. Get baptized. Don't wait. What a wonderful calling and gift we have. I'm going to leave it with that. Loving Father in heaven, as you tell us in the book of Timothy, to come before you and with raising holy hands in prayer, we do that as David did, as Moses did, as Paul obviously did. We raise our hands to you in prayer, dear God, and we ask you to anoint the ones listening to this sermon, especially those coming to baptism. Anoint them with understanding. Watch over your people. Guide your people. Guide me, too, so I can teach properly. Show me where I'm ever teaching wrong. I hope that you will teach me to teach others. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. We hope we can be pleasing before you, dear God, our God, our Father. Come and live in us, dear Jesus. Come and live in your people. Reignite the passion for you, the love for you, and the love for your way the love for Father. Help us never be laid to sin, but repent of it. Come before you in joy and love and passion, zeal. Watch over us. There are many who don't like us. There are many who don't like your way. Put your guardian angels over your people. We thank you for all your blessings and the blessing of baptism, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of Jesus, the Son of God, Yeshua, salvation, Yeshua, 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 thank you. Thank you, Father, for being such a wonderful Father. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference, for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.